Hello, welcome to Cashcroft TV. My name is Kaylin Ashcroft. Thanks for watching another video on History of Leaders of Thought. Today we will be covering Hipparchus and Ptolemy. So sorry to jump back chronologically if you're watching these in order, but I thought it absolutely necessary to cover Hipparchus, especially considering I had the I have and uh, the intentions of covering Ptolemy, who I will cover in this video. It really doesn't make sense to talk about any sort of astronomy or astrology or even mathematics without first addressing Hipparchus, so I thought it was important. Four titles which each I think individually justifies including them in this video series, but also justifies you spending the time to learn about him. is it's considered the founder of trigonometry, which is obviously a huge, huge title to claim. The accidental discoverer of precession of equinoxes, obviously a very huge influence on astronomy. Greatest overall astronomer of antiquity, a huge title to give to an individual, and greatest observational astronomer from classical antiquity until Bra. So, and Bra is obviously a very, very important astronomer as well. So, just even being included in that group is very important. So, nonetheless, worthy of the in inclusion. He was born in Nicaea, which is in modern day Iznik, Turkey. So, um, actually, a lot of these, uh, particularly the 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 people who are kind of pooled into the Greek philosophical or um, learned Greeks, many of them actually came from Turkey. So just important to note. I think partially it, and there's something, maybe I, I always talk about this, but I don't think it's um, take it with a grain of salt. Unless you have high blood pressure, then don't you know lay off the salt. But um, I think geography or just where someone lives obviously has a huge influence on their capacity to he reach high levels of um, learnedness. So I think the fact that Hipparchus was lived in a area where a lot of former philosophers came from and close to Babylon and such, he had access to a lot of mathematics. So obviously, um, independently, he was probably a genius, but obviously his surroundings did help. The exact dates he was born and died are not for certain because there weren't that many biographers back then, especially biographers specifically um, uh, catering to mathematicians or astronomers, but nonetheless, we kind of derive this date from mul multitude of sources. Ptolemy says that he was active from 147 to 127 BC, so obviously a little bit dates there, different dates there, but nonetheless, these are the dates that I've kind of decided on, but it doesn't really matter, like what does uh, 20 years or so, I guess the only... Um, if you want to discredit someone, you can. the dates are important, but it's more important to kind of, uh, at least for the, the course of this video, just to kind of get into his mindset. I think that's the best way to approach history and just try to think like Hipparchus just for a small period of time, um, period of time in your day. So what did he look like? Uh, hard to say as well. These are obviously paintings and drawings from much later dates. In the second and third century, he, there were coins in Bithynia, which is in modern day Turkey with his face on it so two things this also firstly alludes to his significance to justify him being on the coin but also proves that he was probably born in turkey but obviously these coins were from the third and second century so um ad so probably not the most accurate depictions of him anyways so he was one of the first to use a heliocentric system which is obviously very important and that's what ptolemy is very well known for um but he observed that orbits were not perfectly circular, so he kind of rejected the idea. So he was one of the first not to propose a, um, a uh, sun-centric model, but he actually did oppose the heliocentric model. So he was sort of getting closer to the um, knowledge we have today. Um, obviously, like actually, he actually opposed the heliocentric model, but it picked up steam again after Copernicus, so he actually um, was was probably further ahead of than other individuals such as Copernicus who came many, many hundreds of years later. Um, he was heavily influenced by the Babylonians, uh, Babylonians because they were very strong at mathematics and strangely enough, and like they, them and also the Egyptians, they've had a huge influence on all of, you know, the mathematical important thinking, but they never, um, it's usually not attributed to one individual as they often did in Greece and stuff. Maybe it's because they had less celebrity-like um, institutions and more group-like thinking, but nonetheless, uh, I couldn't attribute it to any specific people in Babylon, uh, Babylonia, but he uh, nonetheless learned a lot from them. He was also 
Um, and he brought this back to Greece, where he was the first to divide uh, 360 degrees into 60 arc minutes. So just kind of showing that obviously he he had brilliance in his own right, but he also took a lot from different people and amalgamated things. And I think that's really um, the essence of intelligence. It's great to have one brilliant, creative, unique idea, but to be able to amalgamate many different ideas is holistic intelligence and creates greater genius. And he used the qubit, which is about 2 degrees or 2.5 degrees. So obviously, once again, referencing his Babylonian influence. And yeah, so I guess to let's start off with geometry and uh, trigonometry and other mathematics. So in terms of uh, why he's considered the f founder of trigonometry, obviously, like the Pythagorean theorem already existed. And if you've seen the video I did by, on Pythagoras, Pythagoras probably didn't, or he didn't even discover the Pythagorean theorem, but nonetheless, it's named after him. So it's been, a, been had been a long time running. It had existed for a long time, and trigonometry was a thing. But he's considered the founder of trigonometry because he was the first to create a trigonometric table. Um, and he used this for many applications, such as for the eccentricity of the sun and moon's orbits. Um, one notable, um, I think, significant discovery in terms of trigonometry was uh, a way of measuring the, the length of chord. So, for example, assuming theta is the angle, uh, the chord length is equal to um, sine of theta over 2 times 2 times the radius. So the, the, the length of the chord is a function of the angle and a function of the radius of the square. And it's, this is obviously accurate, so very, very impressive there. Um, Theon, who is, was the father of Hypatia, actually wrote a little um, a writing on this called On Lines of Inside Circle. So once again, um, drawing back to a previous life we covered, Hypatia, Theon was Hypatia's father, if you saw the video. And um, once again, they attribute this to Hipparchus. They, he, 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 in terms of, uh, I guess, uh, kind of a particular, so for his calculation of pi, there was the Archimedes way, which where pi equals 3 and 1 seventh, or 3 and 10 over 7, so, um, or 10 over 71, so obviously not the greatest, um, it's, it's different because now today, like for example, um, I, have pi, I used to have pi memorized to like the 31st decimal place. I don't want to waste your time, but 3.14159265358979323846424 and 2283. I don't know. Two, two, something like that. Well, either way, I have many numbers memorized, but back then, like, how would you how would you possibly come across? How would you possibly get to such precision? So he used a method that um, he might have used the method that Ptolemy later used, where they use a base of six, which is a better approximation. So maybe he came up with that, which was later associated with Ptolemy. But he probably had a, uh, I like to think he had a better or more accurate way of calculating pi than just using Archimedes three and one over seven, which is not that clean. He, um, and also he might have influenced uh, Ptolemy's plane theorem and Ptolemy's theorem, who we'll see very soon in the next, um, life in this video. In terms of lunar and solar theory, he he more accurately uh, calculated the day, the uh, times of eclipses, so you could um, see very important there. He noticed that, and he saw the problem with the moon, because um, in the heliocentric model, and this is where sort of his problems started coming, he noticed that the moon would change in size, like one of this... Uh, this was his way of, he used the moon and the sun and eclipses to calculate the, the size of the sun. Obviously, didn't quite work with much accuracy, but, but because one of the reasons he realized was that the moon would, uh, would firstly vary in speed, which it does do, but it also varied in distance. So it obviously caused a lot of problems. But he also, well, he observed that the, the moon would vary in distance, but the sun had imperceptible variances. Obviously, it does. The thing is that all um, planets rotate around the sun on what's called an ellipse, not to be confused with an eclipse. Eclipse is when a, a, a celestial body surpasses another celestial body, but an ellipse is a shape, kind of like an oval-like shape. So he started noticing there's this heliocentric model, but all these circles are imperfect. So what he did for a time was he moved the Earth slightly off the center, uh, or uh, oh, sorry, the, the, off the center of the sun's circle, but he sort of 
scrap the idea he thought it was just too messy they were trying to justify something that didn't really exist or didn't really um uh justify his own existence so he started realizing there and he also realized this because you know the sun was uh two like two arc minutes off their calculations and all basically although he was amalgamating and picking up a lot of things he was also very scientific in that he was really ready to refute an idea if it did not make logical sense um, it was ultimately uh, Kepler who um, noted the ellipses, who I, I hope to get as far as Kepler, but we'll see how far um, we end up going. In terms of distance, parallax, and size of the moon and the sun, so yeah, he noticed the moon varied in size, but an uh, perceptible change difference in the size. Uh, perhaps he used a diopter to calculate the, the, the sizes and the distances of the moons and suns. Um, what he did was for for calculating the the size of the sun he used two methods in the first book he tried calculating the uh, maximum which was ultimately actually infinity uh or the minimum and then in the second book he tried calculating the maximum size of the sun but the problem was and ptolemy criticized him with that was after he wrote by the time he wrote the second book the the minimum was greater than the maximum so obviously a logical flaw but it turns out that his um, minimum calculation was about 62 times earth's radii and the actual is about 60.3 um so he was actually pretty pretty close um yeah in terms of uh, ellipses he realized that the the ellipses occur once every about five lunar eclipse occurs at once every five months and the solar eclipse every seven months and uh he also observed that the sun could be hidden twice in 30 days in different regions of the planet so obviously i think he wasn't really trying to come to any particular um strong conclusion here but he was more face focused on um observation so in yeah in terms of ge oh yeah geography huge huge influence here um so he created this map of the world and um it was very later ex extrapolated by ptolemy but essentially he start he was one of the first to start using um latitude and he noticed the differences in day lengths between for example more close regions closer to the equator versus regions as you go further north so he really and he started plotting um many places on the planet it, similarly he has what's called the um star catalog where supposedly he he mapped out 850 different stars ptolemy later ex expanded it to 1025 and sort of mod uh, modified the calculation slightly but nonetheless it was a huge huge influence on um and just the way of thinking of of the wor the I guess you could call it the perceivable world both on earth and in the sky. So even though he was coming across these complex uh, calculations that could get to a great deal of precision, he was also most fundamentally a observational astronomer. So he didn't necessarily know how far away the stars were or how big they were, but he thought it was important to map it out. And I think that's a very important foundational thing to do. Supposedly, he wrote um, three books on geography, and he was one of the first to use, or he supposedly, as far as we know, he was the first to use a grade grid in terms of geography. He has what's called the tabla climat, and that's where he pretty much calculates the latitudes for many different localities. So that's Hipparchus. We'll get to Ptolemy, and we'll obviously elaborate much more on him in the comparison. Uh, yeah, so Ptolemy, so pro-astrological authority of the highest magnitude, king of Alexandria, so I just want to uh, preface this, and you're going to look at this and see that's a serious problem, and there's also here is a picture of him wearing a crown, he this is he was not a king of any sort, there, there was other famous Ptolemies, such as the successor, one of the successors of Alexander the Great, and uh, king, king Ptolemy and the Pharaoh, but uh, this, this Ptolemy the scientist was not uh, anything of that, it's just the history's respect for him they gave him that title so he was a mathematician astronomer geographer astrologer uh, he was from alexandria which was 
at the time part of the Roman Empire. So he was probably a Roman citizen because his first name was Claudius. So he was probably, they believe he was either of Greek origin or Northern African origin, but he had Roman citizenship. Probably he was freed by under the government Claudius. That's why he might've got his first name or under the government of or the emperor Nero. Uh, Claudius was also an emperor. He was heavily influenced by Greek philosophers and also Babylonian observations and lunar theory. So very much like Hipparchus, uh, Hipparchus who was influenced by the Babylonians. His most famous book is Almagest, who I briefly covered in, spoke about in uh, Hypatia. Um, it was originally called Mathematical Treaties or Great Treaties. He also has a book on geography and a book on, called Apotelismatic, which is basically uh, like horoscopes and stuff. So it's kind of um, a little bit of a disconnect there. We'll discuss. He, um, yeah, he had a the the name Ptolemy is a pretty common Macedonian name as I mentioned there's it's reference in Greek mythology at one point in its Homeric form Ptolemy the first Soter was the um, as a king of the the first king of the Ptolemaic kingdom uh, Pharaoh and he was formerly in Alexander's army so there's obviously a lot of other famous and important Ptolemy so try not to get confused especially considering in these images he's wearing a crown and he can be referred to as king of Alexandria he's not king um, uh, yeah so either way he probably wasn't Roman just because he was living in Alexandria he was probably either Greek or Hellenized Egyptian but I guess at the end of the day it doesn't really matter what's more important is what he actually thought he um, yeah so I guess we'll start off with astronomy because that's probably his greatest influence so his astronomy is mostly comes from what's called the Almagest which is later modernized by Theon and Hypatia it's also referred to as great treaties um, it included Babylonian arithmetic um, yeah it also included like the start uh, an improved start catalog so obviously expanding on Hipparchus's 850 stars he included 1025 it he kind of got back into the geocentric model in that he um he believed that the, all the spheres including the sun surrounded the earth the he hypothesized, he hypothesized that the sun's radius was 1210 times that of the earth's radius which is actually pretty close um, I guess he was in, very much improving on Hipparchus's calculations, but then again, he does sort of vindicate some of Hipparchus's calculations. He has what's called the handy tables, which is um, you could tabulate data for the sun, the moon, and planets positions, and you can calculate the rising and settings of suns and eclipses. So very, very uh, useful piece of writing. Um, but largely he drew his information from pre-existing information, so it's hard to say what actually was completely original of him, which was that uh, uh, Hipparchus discovered or that the Babylonians discovered, but nonetheless the Ptolemaic name is still nonetheless very, very famous. He had what's called a star calendar as well, which is um, pretty much the almanac as well, and yeah it's so important that it was translated twice into latin so he originally actually did not write in latin he wrote in predominantly arabic which was the um i don't know is the the the, the way that most greeks would write their um science just because i guess the uh the, it, the mathematical revolution probably started more in the Middle East than it did in Greece, whereas Greece just had a lot of celebrities who really got got a lot of credit for it. But um, I I guess we'll quickly talk about the this uh this little formula here. It's basically just um it's got lots of applications. It's pretty much an extension of Hippocrates' line calculation, but you can pretty much derive any shape within um, a sphere, just using this uh, somewhat simple formula. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess um, moving on further into geography. So he wrote this book called Ge Geographia, which uh, here's actually an image um, of what his world. So he pretty much, he covered 180 degrees from the Canary Islands 
what you call the Blessed Islands or Fortunata, all the way as far as China. But he kind of messed up with China. I think it went too far um, south or um, east, and he did not um, predict the Pacific Ocean. So he probably, obviously, I doubt he even traveled this full distance. He probably just heard, used information from older maps. But nonetheless, a very important thing. And he, he recognized that he probably only had a quarter of the world. That's 180 degrees, which is half of the, the world, and then only halfway down to the equator. But he, he calculated it based on the um, the difference in day lengths between the equator and the moon. So some of his calculations can be quite off, but nonetheless a very, very ambitious uh, plan. But also, most importantly, he actually wrote like how to write a map. He wrote topographic lists um, and specific um, um, metrics to include. So not only was it uh, an important piece in itself, it also kind of paved the way for others who wanted to make maps in the future. He actually ended up, um, yeah, so pretty much everything's about one degree off. Um, Byzantium's about two degrees off. Carthage is about four degrees off because he stretched the east and west. So he did not stretch it by length, but he put in uh, more degrees than necessary. And that was just because he did not properly, um, cut, he did not have the proper dimensions of the actual earth itself but nonetheless a very great and useful effort and it probably paved the way for further globalization it's much easier to you know share uh, mathematical information from babylon all the way to the roman empire if they actually know geographically where the two things are so heavy influences into other fields into astrology so he wrote this book called the tetra biblos um, which was which means four books or quadro partium in Latin. It's called. It has almost a biblical authority and was extremely popular. So he believed that, like race and country and upbringing, positions of the sun, moon, and planets at the time of birth have an influence on who one is as a person. So um, here's just one example. He associates each part of one's life with an associated planet, and it has a sort of planetary theme with each of these. So he gets a little bit of criticism because where he was such a formulaic and such an observation-based individual, how did he come up with these sort of, I would call, pseudoscience sort of ideas? If he had run a study, for example, um, this is not something he believed, but for example, he saw that, uh, for example, statistically... He, he took a big group of Leos and found a common trait and compared that with like Virgos or something like that. If he actually had like uh, used samples or some, some kind of statistics, I could believe this astrology. But it seems like he was just kind of pulling these things out of nowhere. And he just um, was attempting to just, I think he was maybe wanted to find more meaning in his world. So maybe he wanted to justify, he spent all those days just mapping out 1,000 250 stars um, or 1025 stars I guess he wanted to have a meaning like why is he doing this it's because it has implications on real life I don't think it necessarily does but a counter argument to that is I never believed this until I read on a standardized test sometimes you read interesting articles but the article was that and I always thought astrology was our horoscopes were complete garbage but it said that people who are born in western cultures in December have a naturally seek attention because they're their birthday is always contested with Christmas. So that made a lot of sense to me. And there's a lot of other truth. I think if you are born in summer, your birthday, for example, is very much more likely to be celebrated because it is everyone's got more free time. So there are certain implications like that. Um, so there is some truth to horoscopes, but I don't I don't put a lot of weight into that of Hippocrates. Uh, sorry, Ptolemies. But nonetheless, you got a lot of Fame there. Here's a brief overview of the order of spheres on the Earth outward of his uh, geocentric model: the Moon, Mercury, Venus, Sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, fixed stars, uh, first move. So obviously some of this is quite quite wrong, but uh, nonetheless he was working on it. And uh, lastly, in terms of music, so he thought that uh, originally Pythagoras had music divided into mathematical. Um, 
division based on a three to two ratio. But Ptolemy used uh, tetrachords and octaves. So obviously octave is when you up an octave, it doubles the frequency, but he just, he wanted to translate music into mathematics, which is obviously a very, very important innovation. He did not, he was not completely, um, did not have the most common way of doing it that we use now, but obviously an important step and just further alluding to his genius and being able to cross different um, uh, intellectual endeavors. In terms of optics, so there was this, for a long time, this debate whether like uh, the light comes off things or the light comes from the eyes. So he believed that the light came from the eyes, kind of like a comb, and it perceives things based on the mind. So I think wrong there, but he had the optics right in that they travel in like straight lines and they bounce. So uh, just once again, alluding to his um, brilliance and being able to cover many different um, fields. And thus, for his important influence, many of these people, as I've mentioned, for some of them, they have craters on them named after them, uh, after their own name. He has craters on both the moon and Mars, so just to one-up everyone. So that's Hipparchus and Ptolemy in terms of their comparison. So they were both, I think, very multifaceted, but I think Ptolemy was a little bit more multifaceted. He got into music. He was a little bit stronger in terms of geography. But um, then again, Hippoc uh, Hipparchus was born and lived so much earlier, he might not have had access. Maybe he, if he was born in Ptolemy's time, he would have been even more multifaceted. I think one thing I actually forgot to mention was um, the uh, Hipparchus's usage of tools. So this is called the, um, the uh, equatorial ring, which can be used uh, to calculate um, uh, eclipses. There's this, uh, or sorry, this is the the armillary sphere. Um, he he either came up with the armillary sphere or the astrolabe, but he probably used both of them. Did he actually invent them? Who knows? But he was, I think, um, uh, very industrious in terms of using these tools. Uh, before these two came the noma, which um, nomon, which used um, shadows for calculating. The location of celestial bodies so basically it went the gnomon to this armillary sphere to the astrolabe and he either discovered the was the first to make an astrolabe or the first to make its predecessor nonetheless he had a huge influence on the inventions so i guess um he did also have a big influence there but i think ptolemy at the end of the day was a little bit more multifaceted but I think Hipparchus was a bit more humble in his beliefs. He kind of gave up the um, geocentric model. Uh, he thought that it didn't make a lot of sense, so he abandoned it. Whereas Ptolemy not only stuck to this geocentric model and sort of tried squeezing things in where they didn't really necessarily fit, he also came up with this kind of pseudoscience um, horoscopes, which I don't think is very meritorious. But on the flip side, he actually was more, I used this comparison on a previous live, in that one is more uh, informative, whereas the other is more instructive. So Hipparchus tells a lot and teaches a lot, but he doesn't ever really sort of instruct how one might live their life, whereas Ptolemy actually has real world um, ways you can live your life based on the horoscopes. So I guess he might have been wrong, but he was had maybe better intentions there. They were both uh, heavily, heavily respected. Their Hipparchus is considered the greatest astrolog um, astronomer of all time. Ptolemy, they called him King of Alexandria, even though he wasn't even the king. And um, yeah, I think they both had a strong observance focus above all. They were uh, observers of the universe rather than um, just kind of coming up with formulas and then finding the observances after. And I thought that was very important. Um, I guess, sorry to jump around, I, I forgot to include these last uh, two quotes. Not a lot of quotes from Hipparchus, I got this one quote. Uh, I've composed a book at the length of the year in which I show that the tr tropical year contains 365 days plus a fraction of a day, which is not exactly 1 over 4, as the mathematicians, astronomers suppose, but which is less than 1 over a quarter by 1 over 300. So obviously not a great quote, but it's just a piece of just showing... Um, a discovery that is very relevant today. So as we know, um, it's not exactly 365 and a quarter days in a year, it's slightly less, but less, slightly better quotes for 
uh, Ptolemy, most events of a general nature draw their causes from the enveloping heavens. So that's kind of an alludes to his um, like sort of horoscopes and that. I know that I am mortal by nature and ephemeral, ephemeral, but when I trace at my pleasure of windings to and from the heavenly bodies, I no longer touch the earth with my feet. I stand in the presence of Zeus himself and take my fill of ambrosia. So once again, as I said, you know, as philosophy is very much medicinal for some people, um, Ptolemy did this. He didn't do it because um, he wanted to be famous. He did it because it was sort of like his medicine. He felt when he looked up at the sun, looked up at his heavenly bodies, his feet came off the ground and it was very uh, uh, spiritual um, uh, event for him. And that's maybe why he was so interested in this spiritual aspect. But nonetheless, they're both very heavily focused on observance, firstly, and that's why they were both also great geographers as well. And that's why they um, came up with so many different discoveries. And I think especially at the foundation, since these people, individuals came so early in history, first observance has to come first, and then comes the actual abstractions and the, the hypotheses. So just chronologically it made more sense for them to be observers rather than anything else so nonetheless that's Hipparchus and Ptolemy I hope you enjoyed this video a little bit different from some of the others a little bit more science focused but I wanted to include them just because it's history of leaders of thought more generally and um, I think it was important for me to learn it and I hope that you enjoyed it and see the value in you learning it yourself so thanks so much